Welcome to our webinar, Surprise, we're homeschooling. <laughs> Many of us are uh, likely finding us in this position that we did not expect. And uh, for, for many of us, maybe we already are homeschooling, and, and, uh, but this is a new time that we find ourselves in. And so I want to talk a little bit about, about this and what the implications are. Uh, for some, this will be brand new, and they're trying to struggle with questions like, do we try to do school at home? What does that even look like? What is homeschooling? What if my, what if, uh, what does it even look like? What if, what if I'm not a good teacher? I remember when I first embarked on homeschooling in the early days, I, I thought that I needed to be a good teacher. I thought I needed to know how to teach subjects. It turns out that that's actually, um, not really a factor at all. It's a very tiny factor. Um, another question that might come up is what if my child won't listen to me? Well, this I, I, I struggled with as well, and, and some of my, my, one of my daughters had a really hard time when I put my teacher hat on and tried to teach her. I had to find another way, and so we're going to talk about some of these things. Also, the big question that comes up, what if my child is bored? At home, and and that word I'll use in quotations. We'll we'll uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but first, before we we dive in, I wanted to just talk about this picture here. Um, this to me, this this embodies the idea of surprise because it. it I, it will require a little bit of explanation, but I had planted in excitement some some wild flowers, and I had just sort of sprinkled them an assortment of wild flowers um, on a little uh, bed that I had uh, where I was living. And when these all came up, all of a sudden there was this random mushroom in the middle <laughs> of this bed, and um, so it, that to me felt like surprise. This was not what we were expecting. None of this is what we were expecting, and and um, and so how do we navigate this? How do we navigate? And I I want to start just by by looking at the reality of where we find ourselves, and and we find ourselves in the midst of alarm and uncertainty. This is a time unlike no other. This is a time where we are all, all of us in the world, sharing this underlying um, uh, challenge and, and threat and danger. And, and it's hard not to ha have that come in and seep into every area of our life. And so here we're faced with this double challenge because now we, in the midst of this, we've got to figure out how to do life. As if it's normal. How do we how do we do this? Nothing is normal. So so what do we what do we do? Where do we even start? Um, so this is the reality of where we find ourselves. The other part of this is that with this reality comes the fact that we are are inevitably facing too much separation both real separation, physical separation from those that we love, those that we care about, as well as anticipated separation. What happens if something happens to the ones I love? What if I can't be with them? And, and that, those kinds of, um, that kind of experience, what it does is it naturally stirs up all of these emotions in us. Because we as humans are emotional beings. And so when we're facing this kind of separation, this kind of, um, these kinds of alarming times, it is so natural for the emotions to be bigger than they ever have been, to be intense, to surprise us even with their intensity. And I want to look at a, a, um, this particular slide that talks about this this idea of facing separation if we have the separation that we're facing there are three primary emotions that get evoked and these are powerful and some of these right now the alarm is the most obvious of course, there's alarm, there's danger, there's threat. This is, we're moved to caution. We have been moved to caution so much so that I won't even pick up a stick on the ground for fear that someone else might have touched that stick. I mean, this is, this, this is intense. 
intense. And so we're living in this place where our alarm is elevated. It is right at the service surface and it can surprise us even when it gets triggered and it looks like for no reason at all, but underlying it is all of this emotion that's building up. What we may not realize is that frustration is also evoked whenever we're facing this kind of intense um, threat, frustration. Something is out of our control. We can't do anything about it. We can't make it work. We can't, for some of us, we can't even go to work. And that is incredibly frustrating. There are so many things that we're faced with and we're up against. Our children are faced with not being able to do their favorite activities. Some of them perhaps love going to school and they're missing being at school. They're missing seeing their people. And we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about alarm and frustration, but there's also pursuit. This is an intensified pursuit that comes as you are facing too much separation. That pursuit comes, that drive for togetherness, to be together at all costs. And this is being thwarted. Uh, this is thwarted feels like kind of the word of the week for me right now as all of these things that I was hoping for all these these classes where I was hoping to go and be in person the conference where I wanted to see all my people and it's thwarted we're no longer able to do these things and this just sends these these emotions around and around and so there's this buildup of emotion and so this is underlying I want us to understand this is our reality. This is what is underlying our attempts now to do life as normal. So keep this in mind. With this in mind, this is not a time to push forward, pretending that everything is okay. This is a time for retreat. This is a time to pull back, to get our bearings, to find our center. Um, it's not a time to do business as usual. And so this is part of our challenge is how do we navigate now schooling, trying to keep up our children's education in a time that is, is not conducive to that. And so this is just a little reminder that this is more the energy needs to go to retreat before we move forward at all. There will be a time. There will be a time where we'll be able to, to kind of get those wheels going again and move forward. Um, but it is not right now. So here, when we, when we look at this, we're, we're not so much looking it's not so much about teaching it's not so much about putting information in it's not so much about getting those outcomes checked off right now it's not even about facilitating learning although that is my 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 favorite expression that is what i um called it when i was was when my girls were learning at home it was for me i saw myself as the one who facilitated that learning and so I have some ideas around this, and we will look at this a little bit at the end. But there's something more important here right now, and especially right now, is that it is about creating the conditions. It is about setting the stage. This is what's important. So we may be feeling, having this fear about falling behind or missing something, but when we are in this alarm state, when all of those emotions are evoked of alarm, frustration, pursuit, by nature, we are not receptive to learning in that state. Generally speaking, we are not in a creative space. Now, we'll give a caveat here because I have seen some incredible creativity come out of this place that we're in right now. But this has more to do with the need, the desperate need for outlets for our emotion. And we're going to move to that. And uh, so you'll have to hold that thought. But what I want to turn to, what I want to turn to is, is, is what do, what do those conditions look like? When we look at things developmentally, we're always looking at what, what 
can we do? What seeds can we plant? What kinds of conditions can we provide so that nature can take over and do the job of growing our children up? And in this case, of learning. The learning will actually unfold quite naturally if we can create the conditions for it. So whether you are trying to, to bring school into the home, whether you are trying to do distance learning and incorporate that into, um, into your world right now, um, or whether you are just in full retreat and you've pushed everything aside, I'm hoping there will be something here for you, something here that will help you bring some of the the, the practical pieces, the, 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 the pieces of, of a homeschooling way of thinking. Now, now I want to be careful here because homeschooling itself is more of a philosophy. And so, and, and there can be many different ways of thinking about homeschooling, many different approaches. And so it's really hard right now to, to even, um, to summarize that. But what I, what I, think all of them have in common to some degree is that it is more about uh, this facilitating the learning at home in a way that allows for it to unfold and so it's very hard to just step in and do homeschooling what we can do is help to help our children to learn at home once we have the conditions in place okay so without further ado what are the conditions? What does it look like to create the conditions? What, what is needed? And I want to look at three different things here. I want to look at relationship. I want to look at routine. And I want to look at release. And we're going to unpack each one of these. We're going to start with relationship. Relationship is about providing a sense of home base. Now, more than ever, we need to be our children's home base. And, and what does that even look like? How do we, how, how do we create a space that, that they feel at home in? And, and the other piece of this is that our children desperately right now need us to be the ones in the lead. They need to be able to lean on us and look to us. What I'm struggling with right now, and, and I'm sure that this is likely the case for many of you, is that my own alarm, my own frustrations are often getting in the way of being able to hold that space for my children. Now, my children are a little bit older now. They're 18 and 21. And so it, it's it's, uh, but it's still important for me to hold the space of saying, we're going to be okay. We got this. We're doing what we need to do right now. And we're together. And, 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 and we're okay. We're okay. And, and it's, we're in this together, but it's also this sense of being the one well, I don't know how else to say it except to say the one with the alpha boots on. I actually had a literal pair of alpha boots that I would put on that would help me remember that I'm in charge here. I need to be the one that takes control. These people are relying on me. They're looking to me for guidance and I need to, to be able to hold that space whether I feel it or not. I may be trembling in my boots, but I need to come across as being the one in the lead. If you take, for example, uh, the pilot, and I've, I've been flying a lot, not lately, but before that I was flying quite a bit, and and I, you would get a little bit of um, turbulence and you would hear, you would hear the, the voice of the pilot come on and what you wanted was the pilot to, to you didn't want to hear them say, oh, um, I'm a little bit nervous, it's, it's a little bit shakier than normal and I'm, I'm I am, um, well, let me see here. That's not what you want to hear. You want to hear from this pilot, ah, there's just a little bit of turbulence. It's all right. Got this. We're going to be okay. Just maybe put your seatbelt on um, so you don't move around too much and, uh, and we'll get through this. Much different feeling than if you have someone that is, is, um, is unsure themselves. And the reality is, is we all are unsure right now. We all have our alarm. But we've got to find a way so that our children 
don't feel it, don't experience it. My daughter was in Ireland um, not that long ago before we brought her home. And when she was in Ireland, she was staying at a home with a wonderful couple, beautiful couple. They were, um, they were so, their, their hearts were in the right place. They were, uh, they were taking care of her, but they had the news on all the time. And what was happening for my daughter is it was too much. It was in, it was in her face all the time and her alarm, she could feel the alarm rate rising. She needed some bubbles as we're going to look at some bubbles where it, it wasn't in her face all the time where she could just try to have some normalcy to be able to go for walks, to be able to do some of those things that brought her back into um, a different kind of world, a world where she felt safe. And so this message, this message of being able to be there and provide the way, again, even if we don't feel it, we've got to find our people where we can talk and vent. I have a sister who I call at late at night and we talk about our own fears, um, but I don't do this with my children. So times of connection, this is so important. Times of connection. I've put some examples here. Reading together. Reading together can be one of the best ways of both having that connection, but also if you are trying to do any learning whatsoever, this is a wonderful byproduct of it. Uh, this was my favorite, um, uh, I don't even know what to call it, my favorite go-to in, in homeschooling was reading with my children. We could sometimes sit for hours just reading out loud. And it doesn't matter the age. I started when my children were five. Um, but I, I, I would have started sooner if I'd figured out how wonderful it was. But it can be all the way up to now. We still like to read together. As I mentioned, my girls are, are, are you know, close, to in, close to 20 now. As adults, there's comfort in reading together. Whether it's reading back and forth, I've talked to so many people who said, we're just going to get a book out and we're going to read a page and alternate together and we're going to do this. Um, there's some wonderful, wonderful stories out there also that can facilitate um, walking through some difficult things one step removed. We're going to look at what that looks like and why that's important. But most importantly here, what this facilitates is the relationship, is the connection. Can we play games together? Do puzzles together? Playing games was also another thing that I did for um, as a uh, as a strategy, so to speak, in homeschooling. I would often, when I was trying to teach my children math, I um, I uh, got out the monopoly, and it took a little while for them to get onto me that I was trying to teach them how to make change. Um, but, but it was you know these word games and the strategy games and the and the number games. But above all, the fruit of it was the time that we spent together. I call it stealth homeschooling when there's like a, another outcome that comes as it, but you're not going for that outcome. It's a byproduct. It's the fruit of it. But what, what was really important was the time together. And right now, that is what's important. I've got a puzzle that I've got set out so that we can go and just do that together when we feel like it. Um, it's about, uh, you know, we play boggle right now after dinner. Um, we, we have a bit of a routine that we've set up where it's, uh, you know, we play three games after dinner before we go and, and uh, work on something else. Um, tea time. Tea time together. These are things that you do together. Together. All right. The other piece that is really important right now is facilitating connection with the child's existing attachments, with their existing relationships, other important people in your child's life. This is where we need some continuity, some bridging, some, some ways of keeping that contact. I've seen some beautiful, beautiful ways of handling this. Some teachers who are doing one-on-one -on -one times and check in, checking in with their students, even just five, ten minutes individually, so that that child feels that connection with that student. Does it take a little bit more effort? Yes, but it's so key because really that's the important piece. 
It's about continuing that connection, that relationship. The learning is secondary in this case. The teaching is secondary. It's can we maintain that connection? Are there other important people that you want to keep that connection with? I witnessed a, a beautiful, um, a beautiful example of this last weekend, and um, my um, my daughter loves to cook, and she got I got wind that there was going to be a um, a pierogi party um, uh, that her grandmother was going to do um, with some of the family members, and I said, oh, Sinead needs in on that pierogi party, and the, what they did was they set this up on Zoom, and multi generation all her aunts and uncles and her um, grandmother and a great aunt, and they were all there making pierogies five hours. They would make a little bit, then they go back, let the dough cool a little bit, and then they come back, and then they, they were all, I had the entire family in my kitchen making pierogies. <laughs> it was beautiful. But we have to be intentional about those kinds of connections. We have to think differently about learning. My child, my 18-year-old child learned more in that day, not just about making pierogies, but about some of her heritage, about, about her family members than she would have looking it up on YouTube, <laughs> although we do that too. But it's that connection, and we have to be intentional about it. That's the piece, because we need to see it as important. OK, so relationship. I'm going to switch now to routine. Routine is another important piece. A uh, routine we don't often think of when it comes to something like this because don't we just throw the routine out of the window? Don't we just, you know, just kind of, uh, nothing's, the, nothing's the same anymore. How do we even have a routine? And yet, it turns out that routine is what actually keeps our alarm down. It's what keeps us with some sense of normalcy, a rhythm in our day. This is what helps give a little bit of structure. Now, this may be flexible. We may be changing our routine often at this point in time as new information comes in, as new, new things we, we, we have to incorporate. But these routines are so important. Even if we're writing one each day, right now my children are creating a routine for themselves each day. We have our routines that we do as a family, and then they are creating a schedule for themselves because they need those spaces. They need a sense of control and predictability in their world right now. We all do. We all need this. And it allows us to have some structures, some, some containers, uh, some bubbles, so to speak, where we're holding this one piece for this amount of time. And in that bubble, things can actually feel a little bit normal. When I have my tea time with my girls in the morning, things actually feel a little bit normal, like the world could feel doable. And from there, we can get on with our day. We find then another bubble. What are we moving to? Well, now we're moving to the walk, whatever it is. Or now we're going to do a little bit of work, whatever that is. Um, we, we, uh, my daughter's work this morning was making bread. She had a, had a schedule set out for herself, and that was, that was part of it. There is containers. There is a way of holding space so that other things don't encringe on it. It means turning off the news for a little bit, for a window, maybe for a long bit. We actually had an agreement in our house. Um, and we, we sometimes cheat because it's far too tempting. Um, but we tried to have an agreement where we would only look together at the news once a day to keep ourselves informed. And we would go to where it wasn't quite as sensational, where we could just look at some of the facts and process it together. And we would do that in a space. And then we would turn it off. It's really challenging when this is all around us. So we need these containers more than ever. We don't even have a hope of teaching, of facilitating learning, of providing for that when we don't have a container for it. It's so important. And as I mentioned, this is helpful not just for our children, but for ourselves. Boy, do I need that routine. 
Do I need to know every night before I go to bed, my girls and I decide when are we having tea? 7.45 is our time right now, and I look forward to that 7.45 time because that's the next thing. That's the next thing that I know. That's the next thing that feels normal, and I can set my day by it. That may not be the same thing for you. You've got to find your own ways. And I, I've written here some examples. Um, like I'm ta I keep talking about this tea time every morning. That literally does set my day. Sometimes we have multiple tea times. When it's hard, when the day is challenging, when there's a lot happening in the world, it means we need even more touches to home base. We meet for tea at 11 o'clock, at 2 o'clock. Do you see what I'm saying here? We've got to find these touch points. We've got to find these containers. We have a game time after dinner every night. It helps get some of those giggles out, really. Like there's the laughter. There's a, was, some of us were talking. We were, we were laughing and joking before this started. And we were talking about how we need those, those places. It feels like everything is so serious right now. And it is serious. But we've got to find those, those places for laughter. We've got to find those places to let this out. And we will sit and we will laugh and we will play and we make up our own rules. But it's something that we do together. And this is not just a routine. This is helping to build our relationship. So you notice I may have put some of the same things in the relationship building page. And now I'm putting it into routine because I need to make those things. We need to make those things a routine in order for them to happen. Or it would just be something we'd long for or want, but didn't have any space for. We've got to create that space. We've got to do this. And we've got to read the needs and see what's needed. We've got to take the lead in what's needed to be able, what do we need to make space for? To be able to create those containers. What do, what, what do we see? Do we see that there's more connection time needed? Then we build in more tea times. Our routines can change daily. <laughs> Just because it's a routine doesn't mean it has to be set. And we need to have flexibility. We may decide this is a rough day. We're watching movies all day. And that's okay. You call the shots. You're saying this is what we're doing. This is what's needed. And that's okay. <laughs> That's okay. The world, you know, we, we will find our way back. There will be, there will be, I'm guessing by the next day, there may be some more space, some more room because we've, we've got to get, sometimes we've just got to, we've just got to distract ourselves a little bit. We've just got to find some of those ways where there's some normalcy. Maybe we walk, maybe we do a hike for an entire day. We're outside for an entire day. That's going to fill us up in a way. Um, and so we need to be prepared to change our routines and to be in charge of our routines. Yeah. And to even give our children some, some, some autonomy here with this. Can we get their input? Um, can we give them some space? Not in a way that's going to make them nervous or feel like you don't have control, but in a way that says, what do you want to incorporate today? Especially as our children get older. What would you like to make time for? Is it building Lego together? Okay, Len, we're going to put, this is going to be our Lego time. So you can either go and take the lead ahead of time or you can involve them a little bit in, in what that looks like. Again, depending on the age of your child. The important thing to remember is that you're not putting the child in, a, in the lead in a way that's going to raise their alarm. Then it's going to make them feel it's all up to them. Because right now they need that someone's holding this more than ever. So some of the ideas that I've given here, um, uh, uh, walks, regular exercise time. We're going to look at this in terms of the next thing on release. But having something, being outside has been my saving grace. When I just can't handle things anymore and I feel like I, I'm going to crack under the overwhelming pressure and the overwhelming weight of what's going on in the world, I take a walk. I go to the water, I sit under a tree, I listen to the birds. This is a world outside of all of, all of what's going on that brings me back to a place that reminds me, if, funnily enough, of our humanity, <laughs> of who we are. It brings me back to that place and so nature has an amazing ability to be that compass point, to be the, to get our bearings, and if we can do that together, 
with our loved ones as much as we can, even better. I say here too, I have watching a show together. Some of you may be saying, well, that's frivolous. Why would we watch a show? They can do that on their own. And I actually don't want them doing that kind of, I'm trying to discourage their, their screen time. Now, this is something different. I am talking about doing this together, having a special show that you pick, something that is a special time together. This has been something that I established um, when my when my children were, were a bit younger. I, I We went through the entire series of Gilmore Girls with one of my daughters, and they both were interested in different things. So this was neat to have some one-on-one -on -one time with each of my girls. It was just, you know, 20 minutes, something like that. But it allowed us this time together to have a shared experience, and it was really important that we were together on it. It gave us something to talk about, to laugh about, to identify with in a different way. It allowed us to touch on subjects that we would have never been able to go at directly. Um, this is something different than just putting on the TV and hoping that your child can keep themselves busy. This is not, what, this is not the same thing. It is not the same thing. And this can be part of our routine. And then now what I've also put on here, I, I've got work time, work time between times of connection and release. The reality is we may have learning outcomes that our school has given us. We may have curriculum that we are trying to get through. We may have distance learning that we are trying to navigate and try to figure out how we do this online time with real time and how do we how do we structure that what i feel like is the most important thing to remember is that we need to create containers for this even more so we need to couch it we need to sandwich it in between times of connection and of release, which is what we're going to go to next, of finding these areas where we have an opportunity for our emotions to come out. And so let's move to that now. Let's move to that place of release. This, um, this picture just reminds me of this, of the steam coming up here. This is, uh, is, is a hot spring in, um, in Iceland. And you could just feel the heat rising when you're when you're close uh, close to these. We have so much emotion stirred up in us right now. Our children have so much emotion stirred up. The alarm, the alarm can be through the roof. We don't even know what to do with it. How do we even how do we even go there? How do we, what do we do with all of the, the frustration, all of the disappointments, all of the things that we are thwarted in? We cannot be together in the same way. And when a loved one, when a loved one dies, we can't even be together in person to grieve together. That is just going to fundamentally change how we do things and, and what's needed. We, we, we. What's needed is for these places to be able to be together. And that's the very thing that we're not able to do right now. And so it just gets pushed down. Or at least that's the threat, is it gets pushed down. It gets shoved down because there's no room for it. There's no room for it. There's no room for the disappointment. There's no room for the frustration. There's no room for the alarm. But guess what? It's got to go somewhere. It's uh, For those of you that have seen the movie Inside Out, one of my favorite lines is when Disgust says in this oh, great voice, it's, she's got such a disdain, but she says it so well. She goes, emotions can't quit, genius. They can't quit. They have to go somewhere. They have to move. And so we can fool ourselves for a while. Or we can kind of shove them down for a while, but guess what? They're going to leak out somewhere. They're going to leak out. Maybe a couple kilometers down the road, there's going to be something springing up because there hasn't been any space for it over here. And so we're going to be surprised. We're going to have all of these strange behaviors popping up, and maybe already in your children, where you're going, what is that about? Why are they snapping at the cat? 
when when did when did that happen what the cat didn't do anything this has nothing to do with the cat exactly the cat was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and that child was frustrated that child was alarmed it is its connection was thwarted it's got to go somewhere so what we can do is we can actually facilitate intentional outlets to help get some of it out. And you think, well, this isn't school. I thought we were going to talk about school. <laughs> no. But there is no schooling that's going to happen. There is no learning that's going to happen if a child has so much emotion built up in them. This is what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help under, uh, those that I'm working with right now, te new teachers going into, into the field. We've got we've to recognize that when a child is acting out, when a child is all of a sudden has this attacking energy, is aggressive, it tells us something. There is something going on for the child. That child is frustrated or that child is alarmed or that child... It needs to grieve. They, they had an incredible loss in their family, a change, a move, something. And there has not been the space for those emotions to move yet. And so, yes, it's coming out in those behaviors. And so, yes, part of being one who facilitates learning means we've got to be aware of this. Because if we want there to be any learning happening, any growing happening, any maturing happening, We've got to be able to find a place for those emotions to come out. So this could be, this could be something as simple as going for a run. Both my daughters are jogging right now. I've got one that cycles. I told her, I said, you know, you always cycled when things were hard. You just got on your bicycle and you went. From a, young, from a young age, we've got to look to see what are our children's natural bents? What can we work with? What can we help suggest? What can we help build in to their routine? Now, one of my daughter's routines, or her releases, sorry, is kickboxing. She went to regular classes. She can't do that anymore. So we had to find another one. We had to find something else to fill it in. And this is going to be so key right now is when you have activities that have been canceled, things in your child's life that may have been serving this purpose, you may not even be aware that that karate class was helping get out some of that emotion. Well, now there better be another thing. <laughs> there better be something else that you can do. Can you be doing some karate at home? Can you get creative with this? Can you um, create? I've, I've got a colleague whose child would get frustrated quite often and she would she would build forts of, of cardboard boxes in her living room only for them to be destroyed and then she would build them all again and she would get new cardboard only for them to get destroyed but that was the important piece <laughs> it was getting out some of that frustrated energy and some of the some of the energy that's building up I know for myself is a sense of powerlessness I think that's why I'm drawn to jigsaw puzzles right now. I was thinking about this the other day that, that I know all the pieces are in the box, or at least I hope they are in case I dropped it somewhere and they're missing, which would add to the frustration. But for the most part, I'm pretty sure there's a piece. And I'm pretty sure it belongs somewhere. I just got to figure it out. There's an answer. I need an outlet right now for that energy that needs somewhere to go, of needing that, that predictability, that, that feeling of being in control of my world. It would be interesting to look around and see what is it? What is it that you are naturally drawn to? For some, it's baking. I think this is wonderful if you're the recipient of this. I have a, a child who is baking up a storm and, and, and um, you're just baking me fresh rye sourdough bread <laughs> every couple of days. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. But you have to remember here, it's not about the outcome. It's not about making something. It's about the process of making it. It's about the process of releasing something. 
there may be an outcome at the other end. Some of these things, a pierogi party had an outcome, but that's not necessarily what it was about. Even the, the crushing of the mashed potatoes can be an outlet. I find myself walking down the trail, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with the trembling horse. I, it's a Qigong practice, and a, it's probably a yoga practice too. Um, but it's where you, you think of a horse in a field. You picture the horse in the field and, and where it kind of shakes off. I won't do it right now because I'll probably freeze my screen. But I find myself doing this several times a day. It used to be maybe, you know, once a week I would feel the need, but no, I am needing to be that trembling horse a whole lot. I have to shake it out. I have to, to get it out of me. Maybe it's shaking out the sillies. It's moving around. It's having a dance party. It's having a sitting around the kitchen and, and singing at the top of your lungs. Um, I like to play percussion or pretend I'm playing percussion. That helps me get it out. Finding what you and your children need right now will actually help you in the long run with any learning that needs to happen. Especially if we can do this, as I mentioned, before any time of needing to concentrate, of having to focus. This is important. Equally important, equally important is room for sad feelings and disappointments. This is something that we're almost the first, we want to just shove it down. We want to pretend it's not there. And yet, this is huge. There's so many disappointments. I was at my, my nephew's birthday party by Zoom. I wanted to give him a hug. I wanted to, to you know, to hear, have him hear his happy birthday sung in unison instead of in this crazy Zoom-like <laughs> fashion where nobody's in tune or in line. But, you know, we did what we could. You saw all his family members entering in. It, at least we did that. But he couldn't have any friends over. There's disappointments that everyone's facing, missing prom, graduation ceremonies. We're all missing things, not being able to work, not being able to make the money we need. Um, there's all kinds of things, losses to grieve. We may, have sick, we, have, we may have loved ones that are sick, that we're concerned about. And, and we need space for this. And it's funny how we can find places for this. The, 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 um, you know, first of all, I wanted to say that, that normalizing this, this is normal. It is normal to have these feelings. It is normal to be disappointed. It is normal to feel sad. We often feel like we have to fight it or we have to put on a stiff upper lip and just be happy. We got to find the happy parts of this. Um, and there will be times for that. But we all, if we don't make room for the fact that this is hard, this is not how we wanted things to be. This is not what we envisioned for our world, for our, our loved ones. This is, not, this is not what we want. We have to make room for those or it will eat us up. And if we can make room for those on the other side of it, we will find our laughter, we will find those moments, we'll find our resourcefulness, we'll find the ability to move forward. But we got to make room for it. And often making room for it is doing this one step removed. And what I mean by that is that we can't look at these things directly. It's like looking right at the sun. We can't do it. I find myself right now drawn to an alarming TV show. It's an emergency room TV show. This is not something I normally do, but I am drawn to it. I am drawn. The alarm in me needs to be matched somehow by a fictional alarm that I see processed in front of me. I'm able to grieve the losses that I experience on this fictional show because it helps drain the sadness in me, the things I can't look at directly or talk about directly because it's just too much. Our children need this too. Our children need these places. And this is where, as I mentioned before, through books, this is where we can read a story. 
We read, we are, our favorite stories to read were historical fiction, where they were journals, they're fictional journals, but they were written in live time, in, in real times, real settings, as if this could have happened, as if it was for real. But it was, it was written from a child's point of view. And we, yes, we learned a lot about those times. It was a great teaching tool. It was a great learning tool. But we experienced also what it was like for that child to live through that time, to lose a sister to an illness, to, to be separated from one's parents. All of these experiences that were so hard to look at face on. We were able to do through the stories, through the reading of the stories, through identifying indirectly. I, I will never forget one particular story reading. Some of the classics were the best for this. The British authors just had this down. Um, and this was the author of Secret Garden. Um, and it, the book was A Little Princess. And there, there's many, Little Lord Fauntleroy. There's a whole series of them. Um, and, and in this particular book, there was a chapter where the father died. And I remember sniffing this as I went through and I, 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 I myself was a bit allergic to sadness, didn't want to go through it, but I realized, okay, we got to do this. If my children can do this, I can do this. We're going to read this. And I wept through the entire chapter and my children wept in their beds as I read this to them. But we made it through and boy, did we need that release. The tears we were crying were, were partly for the character but they were partly for all the things, the fears, the, the sadness that we couldn't name, that we couldn't go to directly. It gave an outlet for it. It gave an avenue for it. We need to build these things in to our lives, to our lives. It used to be there in our culture. There used to be spaces for this through, through drama, through, through music. We're losing that, and so we need to be intentional about it and find those places where we can access that part of us in a way that isn't over the top, isn't too vulnerable. One step removed. And true play. True play. This is what true play is about. It is one step removed. It is not for real. There is some freedom when we look at play, and this is not screenplay. The release does not come in screenplay because screenplay is about it, the outside coming in. It's about stimulus. This is making room for the inside to come out. This is expressive. This is exploratory. This, this is a place where a child can process their world, their emotions through this. Right now we have this... this um, um, this, this thing that was going around, uh, a colleague of mine's um, child came home playing coronavirus tag. And there was a lot of shocked parents and how can we, this feels so insensitive, how can, how can we be playing, how can they be playing that, how can they be doing that? And, but if you take a step back, you realize this has been the case throughout time. Our children have to make sense of their world. They, they, this is how they do it. How else do you do it but play with it? It's not for real. We gotta play with this. There's children playing, they're putting their dolls in isolation. They gotta play it out. How do you even process that kind of thing? How do you process this new word in our vocabulary now, social distancing? You know, this is a whole new thing. How do we do this? We gotta play it out. And we've gotta make room for that. How do we create spaces? Yes, and that whole, the whole idea, the ring around the rosy about the plague, right? This is, this is, if you listen to the words, yes, it's dark. Yes, it's dark, but this is a dark time. If we don't touch on it in a way, you know, you, I, I don't know about you, but I found some of my dark humor coming out. I'm joking about things, and my, you know, my older daughter was looking at me horrified at one point because her boyfriend told me a joke that she was just thought was, awful and I thought yeah that's awful but boy that's funny and we need to we need to have those spaces to laugh we need to have those spaces where where to make room for the darkest we got to make room so how do we create those spaces how do we create those freedoms for our, our children and for ourselves some ideas here um, some examples 
and I've talked about some of these already, movement is an incredible thing for release. Dancing, just moving, just putting on some music. Um, the trembling horse that I talked about, um, you know, and someone in the chat was describing the, their dog doing that shake off when there's been an alarming situation. This is just, this is a natural thing that we want to shake it off. Um, I find myself, I, I started singing a song with my girls. We were all singing together. They're both musical. And it's a beautiful gift to have right now is to have that music. And I started singing. And I started just being really silly, and I started singing at the top of my lungs. I was not on tune. In fact, I even tried not to be on tune, and I yelled those lyrics. My girls, I think, thought I was going crazy, but boy, did it feel good. Boy, did it feel good. I had to get it out, and much better in that way than yelling at my children, which I'd done the day before, by the way. <laughs> because the frustration got the better of me, and it came out. I thought, this isn't about them. This is about me. This is a not about cleaning the pan after you make eggs. This is about me feeling out of control of my world, and I've got to find some places to release that so it doesn't interfere with me being the parent that I need to be right now. So we need to have some grace for ourselves in this as well. Walking, doing something regular, you know, making room for the silliness, making room, whatever that exercise is for you, whatever that movement is, whatever that... Um, you know, maybe it's going out and, um, and, and, and smashing pottery, old dishes, and later making mosaics out of it. But the smashing of the dishes is what's going to bring the release. Maybe you can get your recycling, since right now I don't know about you, but I can't take my recycling out. So <laughs> I can stomp on the cans, I can rip up the paper, I can do all kinds of things with that recycling in the meantime. And it can actually provide a wonderful release. Again, what does this have to do with schooling? Everything. Everything. If you can make room for this, if we can find our way through this, if we can find a way through to, to, to giving some outlets for our very real stirred up emotions, that learning is just going to happen. And it's gonna, we're going to be amazed by what can happen. And we'll go to that. We'll go to that next. But first, I just want to make a mention about the, the books, the movies, the shows. Again, these may, the movies and the shows may seem frivolous, but they serve an incredible purpose. It was like the play, the drama of the ancient Greeks, the comedies and the tragedies. They provided places to release the comedic relief, the, the laughter, the mocking, and all that energy, and also the drama. The, the tragedy to be able to have a place for our tears. It's the same thing now. Now, now not all of these shows will provide that. There are some that, that lend itself to this far more than others. Shows that, you know, This Is Us is a show. And my, my daughter says sometimes, she goes, I just can't cry today. I just can't watch it. Because she knows she cries every time. And so do I. I don't even, I have a book that I read that I, I, I don't even know what it is. I get to the second last paragraph and I start crying. It's just, it facilitates something. And if we can actually face those, if we can make space for those and not run away from it, we'll be softer. We'll be softer for our children. We'll be softer for ourselves. And so finding those places where those outlets are, not, you know, not saying, oh, I shouldn't be watching so much. No, finding those places where sometimes it's just a pure distraction, but sometimes you find yourself in that distraction actually releasing something that needed to be released. And music, music. Oh, first of all, before I get to music, um, someone else put in uh, the Up movie. Oh my goodness! If you, if it's better if it can take you by surprise. But the movie Up, I have not talked to anyone who has who has um, come away with that without the tears. It surprises you. Um, but there's a lot of places like that where we can find those outlets. And we need those times. This can be just part of our routine, too. It's just as much. It's just as important. It's not frivolous. And it's not not schooling. <laughs> it's important. It's important. So back to music. Music. Music has an incredible gift. I, I will never forget when I first saw um, someone sent to me the videos of the Italian singing. Um, of them out on their balconies, 
and playing the music, I just wept. I wept because that music was a release. It was the only release. It was something culturally that brought them together. It was something that brought their humanity, their, their connectedness on a deeper level and release something. It allowed them to process that in a different way. And there's places, every culture has that kind of music that is, is there to facilitate, to facilitate that. Um, I long, you know, I often long for melancholy music. I have my, my daughter, she has a playlist that she just calls sad music. And she puts it on when she just feels the need to be sad. Luckily, she's not like her mother was at her age. I would just run, I would run fast in the opposite direction of anything that sniffed of sadness. But hopefully, I've been able to normalize it enough for her that she actually embraces it and goes, I need this right now. This is what I need. Both my girls play music. The other day, there was a spot of sunshine, and my daughter was out playing her guitar, just sitting on the only dry patch she could find, just playing her heart out. She needs that music more than ever right now. And there are so many stories of this, of, of finding the music in us, but also of sharing others' expression of that music. The music itself touches something so deep in us, so core to who we are. And it can provide that release. This goes way, way back in time. It's, it's the one thing that's been with us. And with, uh, you know, you look at the whales, the whales and the music that they have, their way of communicating and, and the emotion in that music that they create. This is something that is, is so deep and so powerful. So we need to be able to get those record players out, dust them off. I have one right now that I have going and I just put on the records and, 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 and every once in a while I'll come across a piece that I will need to play over and over again. Just need to play it. Uh, Pachelbel's Canon has that effect on me too. <laughs> um, all different genres of music. My girls have their own. I find rap right now also really helpful because it helps get that edge. Um, we will go through and recite Alexander Hamilton. My daughter knows it all by heart, I think, and so she'll uh, she'll help help me through, and I'll just mumble about every fifth word. <laughs> but it helps get some of that energy out. It's um, music is so key. In fact, I probably should have had that word not so small, but really big on that page, on that slide. Music, music can help us through this. So how do we help our homeschooling? Play more music, do more music together, do some percussion together, do some singing together. We need to have our choirs. What I'm missing right now is this, or what I was missing until both my children came back to me, um, was that ability to sing together. And because I live not close to my neighbors as many um, as, as they do in Italy, where you can see this beautiful possibility of being physically distant, but not, but not distance at the heart. And uh, a beautiful, beautiful illustration of that. And I'm sure you all have your own stories of witnessing that and of being part of that. I think even some of the the stories I've been hearing about the, um, now again, I don't live in the city and so, but those that live in the city and there are times where they, they take to clap um, and bang pots and pans for those frontline workers in gratitude, I think that's twofold. Yes, it's touching on the deep humanity and our connectedness and our, our, our gratefulness that we're in this together, there's also something about the release. Banging those pots and pans helps get out some of that built up emotion in a way like no other. It's amazing. Amazing. I could talk more about this. There are so many different ways of doing this. This could be a whole webinar in itself, and perhaps it will be. Perhaps we'll do a follow up um, on this and, and share some more ideas. But I want to bring right now to what if you're able to provide some of these conditions? What if your child is looking to you? What if there, there's things, um, um, they're ready, they're ripe for learning, they're curious, they've got a little bit of curiosity in them. Go with that curiosity. Go with that. 
try to fit whatever they're supposed to be learning into their existing interests if you have any say in the matter. And if you can, just put pu push pause on the curriculum for a while. Put that aside and just go with what engages them. My daughter loved space. She loved space. She would carry around a space encyclopedia with her, always. And it was big and thick. And she was only about six years old, seven years old. I remember the time she came to me. And, and this was the time where we'd have, you know, I was still practicing stealth homeschooling. And I was trying to sneak in whatever I could to, to fit the learning outcomes that, were, that I was supposed to be doing without her actually knowing it. And so I remember her coming to me one day and I remember thinking, well, we had to have outcomes where they do presentations or things like that. But I, if I told her, if she even sniffed that she was supposed to do it, no chance, no chance. Like I say, I could not teach this child. I could only sneak in and facilitate, put things in place. I would leave books out on the table and she would pick them up. Surprise! <laughs> Um, and and find oh this looks interesting but if I said I think you should read this book no way there was no way that was happening so anyway my daughter who loves space comes to me one day about seven years old says to me mom could I do a, a PowerPoint on homeschooling I mean a, a PowerPoint on homeschooling a PowerPoint on Jupiter please would that be okay and I remember, I, I still remember it like it was yesterday, because I remember thinking in my head, would that be okay? I'm supposed to try to force you to do this, and you're coming to me asking permission? <laughs> and, and I remember thinking, okay, check yourself here, look surprised, oh, well, I don't know, um, well, do you think you could do that? I don't know, that sounds, that sounds hard, are you sure? Are you sure that's what you want to do? <laughs> and, and, uh, and sure enough, there she goes, makes a power. PowerPoint on Jupiter. She didn't even know how to use PowerPoint, but she figured it out because she wanted to do a PowerPoint on Jupiter. I think probably because she saw me doing presentations and working with PowerPoint and decided she actually now knows how to use it much better than I do. Um, but she was curious about it. She was engaged in it. If we can go with what our children are engaged in, with what they are already interested in, go with that. If they're learning to read, find a book that they're interested in. Not the ones that you get that you're supposed to read because they may not even care. We learn the best to those, those magic treehouse books where you enter into this imaginary world and the treehouse gets taken away and you're, you're all of a sudden in a, in a completely different world. That's where we learned because it was engaging. It brought you in to the story. And so when we can go with where our children are already at, even if they're not showing a lot of curiosity, we can see what interests them and start from that point. We can throw things at them, I throw things at them gently, um, in terms of stealth, stealthily sneak things in that we think they might be interested in. But you may be surprised if you, if, but don't be surprised, I should say, if you find what interests them and then you come at it and say, oh, I really think this should be, you know, you should do this and you should do it like this. Well, chances are they're just going to push it away even if they are interested. So you've got to find a way that keeps them engaged. When my daughter started learning how to play the violin, I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be tricky. Because my daughter, as I mentioned, did not like to be taught. She did not like someone to tell her how to do something. But you cannot just learn a violin without having some notes. It's very painful if you don't know notes. So I, uh, this was brilliant. I had friends over, happened to have friends over the weekend. She'd just gotten her violin. She was going to do this all on her own. And that, that, those friends were both violin players. One was a particularly good violin player. And she, I said, I pulled her aside and I said, hey, you think you could kind of help her maybe with the notes without letting her know that you're helping her? <laughs> and sure enough, she helped and, oh, let's do something fun and let's just put little stickers on there and this is the note, this is this note, and this is this note. And they made it play, they made it fun. Before I knew it, she knew the notes. From there, she was okay. She could go and explore on her own. She could go. So sometimes we need to give a little bit of structure, a little bit of the rules of the game, but we have to do it in a way that they're not going to push up against. And so again, making it play, making it fun, making it engaging. This is our best way through with everything, whether it's learning an instrument or learning math. 
my daughter used to cook with me in the kitchen. She still, as you hear, loves cooking. She started off making biscuits from a very young age, probably about six. I had her in there helping me with biscuits for our family Sunday dinner. She knew all the measurements. She could, if we were having people over, she could triple that recipe. If it was just a small group of us, if there was only two of us home that weekend, she could have the recipe. I remember her getting to, uh, to a place where she actually had to do a test to see where she was at with her math. And she was terrified and she said, Mom, what are these things, or Mummy at the time, what are these things called fractions? I don't know any of this. And I just looked at her and I said, oh, fractions, that's just a fancy word for, you know, when you triple the recipe and when you half the recipe and when you quarter it, you have a quarter teaspoon. And she goes, oh, oh, yeah, 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 okay, I got it. I didn't have to call it fractions. My girls never learned grammar even. They learned how to read a good book. They learned how to write because they learned they were, we were reading together and they learned what good literature was. My daughter now is in fourth year, creative writing. She's editing. She didn't have a formal background in those things. She was interested in it. She was engaged in it. She, she listened. She knew what was good. She could understand. And she went with it. She went with it. She didn't get stuck on that idea of outcome, of right and wrong. We can get really stuck on things being right or wrong, and it can stop us in our tracks. If we're trying to help our children at home, we need to make room for mistakes. I don't know if you can see the book behind me here. I've got, it's called The Big Book of Mistakes. It's a gift from Genevieve. Just love it. It's all about mistakes are part of the process. This is not, this is not a, it, it should be something called, there should be a word that talks about intentional mistakes. We've got to try things out. We've got to, we've got to uh, not be so, so concerned about what something looks like and the outcome of it. We've got to make room to just explore, to have accidents, because in those accidents and things that we're not intending, beautiful things can happen. Beautiful things. So this, this is one of the common things. This is one of the core things about learning at home is creating lots of opportunities for mistakes. Just to try it out, I'll give you one more example. Spelling tests. I was an excellent speller as an as a elementary school student. But I was an excellent speller because I was really good at, at remembering things. So we would be given our list of, of words. And I don't know if you remember this. Many of you are probably had in the same era where we'd get our words and um, we'd have some time to study them. And then we'd do a test. And it was very serious. And I really was not OK with not getting less than perfect. And um, and I was really determined. And so I would learn that way. Now, fast forward many years, it came time for me to help my daughters with spelling. And I decided that I wasn't going to do things the same way. I What I started doing was I started observing what words weren't they spelling. Well, they didn't know how to spell beautiful. They kept spelling that wrong. Well, it's a tricky word. They they got the apostrophe wrong in certain things. So I'd like keep my own little running track of things. And then what I would do is I would have, we would have um, our spelling bee. And I would pick 10 words and I would just give them some words they actually knew. And most of them they didn't. And that didn't even concern them because they didn't even know how those actually were supposed to go. And so I would just say, you just try it out. What do you think? Guess. And and that's what they did. And they had fun with it. They would make it up. They'd like, I don't know, this looks like it could be it. And then we'd talk about it. We'd laugh about it. We'd go, well, actually, that seems like it would be that way, but it's actually like this. And in that process, guess what? They learned. They're two of the most incredible spellers that I've met. And they didn't do it by outcome. By, by trying to get it right. They got it because they had room to experiment and explore. And that piece um, is so important. And I think um, so many things in our lives would look different if we had the opportunity to just to not for it not to be about what it's supposed to look like or what it's supposed to be. Let's just explore. What do we think might be the answer? Not what is the right answer. 
This is an opportunity that we can have discussions around this. This is, we can just talk about it. Well, what do you think about this? Before we look up Google, <laughs> that's our rule at home. We have to have some discussion about it before we look it up. When we're playing Boggle, we talk about the word for a bit and we're actually each one of our rules is that we can each make up a word for each round if we can make up a definition for it. And it's really quite, quite fun. It's quite hilarious. And, but there needs to be some space for that. Where is there room for that? Well, hopefully there is at home. Hopefully there is a, 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 a space that we can make for that kind of exploration because that is where that is where that is where the learning will actually happen. That is where it will actually sink in. I was a really good student. I knew the answers at least for a week. But then I was gone. It didn't sink in unless I was interested in it, unless I had a chance to explore it myself. Those were the things that, that sunk in for me. And so when I, when I was with my children, I had the opportunity to help them learning at home for many years. That's the angle we went. It's about exploring their world. And in that, there's a lot of learning to be had. But it almost happens by accident. So I will leave it there. I think there's a lot more that could be said. I... Um, I want to leave you with, with where to find more. Um, I touched on several things here, and I want to just let you know about some of the opportunities. I'm going to just go through these one, -on -one, one by one. First of all, I have to introduce my, my, um, my late rooster, Pistachio. Uh, he was with us for many years. Um, he just makes me smile. So I decided to put him at the center of this page. <laughs> all right. We need things that make us smile, by the way, especially right now. So related courses, if you go to our website, you can find out uh, more about courses. We actually have um, Jennifer, who's actually here right now in the, in the filming of this, uh, the recording of this is here. Uh, Jennifer and I um, had the pleasure of putting together a course on homeschooling called Rest, Play, Learn. And that is geared more towards um, when you're, whether you're thinking about homeschooling, um, but it may be helpful to you if you're interested in it. You could do it self-paced. Uh, Jennifer is there to guide you through it. Um, and it just talks about what we're trying. Again, more on what the conditions are. How do we actually help, um, help this unfold? So that's there. A wonderful course on, called The Vital Connection, all about attachment and connection, relationship. Um, relationship uh, with our children, relationship, fostering relationships with, uh, with others in their lives as well, the important people, the grandparents, aunts and uncles, mentors. Make a sense of anxiety. This is an amazing course that uh, will really help right now too in the time that we're living in, in a time that's just fraught with anxiety and alarm. Um, it's a four session course. Play 101, an amazing course. All, a lot of what I was talking about in terms of play and release outlets, um, this course speaks to. It's a four session course and I just found out that it looks like it will be offered uh, this um, coming up in the next few months um, by um, our amazing faculty member, Jewel App from Berlin, uh, who just does a, a beautiful job of this. So um, you can also take it self-paced, uh, but there's many courses there. There's over 20 courses, so you can go and take a look at yourself. Also, if something strikes you and you just really really want some extra help. You want some more help. You want um, to, to meet one-on-one -on -one with someone. Um, there's many of us that do consults. I myself do consults. I've opened up a bit more space right now um, for that um, at, this, at this time. Um, and, and there's many people there on the, on the Newfeld Institute website who you can go to and uh, look up their profiles um, and our, our faculty or facilitators who would be able to help you. Uh, I also want to mention, um, if you're looking for ideas and activities for release, uh, my colleague Hannah Beach, we actually just uh, finished a book to get, well, we finished it a little while ago. There's a book that will be released soon in, in um, mid-April called Reclaiming Our Students. Um, and uh, there is an activity guide that goes with that, that Hannah put together. It has amazing activities. You get that free with the book. Um, but she has been sharing some of those activities weekly on her blog. So if you want a sneak peek and you want to go look, go and sign up for her, um, for her blog. She's posting things on, um, on movement and different activities that you can do with your children at home. Uh, pretty fun ideas for release. 
And lastly, if you're looking for more, um, this is something that is in the works right now, uh, doing some, some future support sessions, maybe some group consults, some Q&A sessions. If you want to follow up uh, with some of the themes that we've been talking about, I plan on offering something in the next month or so. Um, so you can go and sign up for updates through my website, tamarastrijack.ca, and, um, and I will uh, keep you informed as to what is happening. And I think we will stop there and move to some questions. So I will invite Genevieve to come up. Yes. Hello, Hello Genevieve. Uh, thank you so much for that. Wow, what a rich session. My goodness. Lots of food for thought. Yeah. Well, I, there's a lot more, but I hope that there is uh, enough there to, um, to give you some ideas and to help you feel not so alone in it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, and I see uh, lots of responses to what you were saying, Tamara. Uh, Karen, I think you said that so well. Thank you, Tamara. I take it is less about outcomes and more about creating the opportunities and conditions for exploration. It's yeah. very much encouraging. I couldn't agree more. That's, for me, what I'm taking out of this the most, where, you know, that amazing image you had at the beginning, Tamara, of that of that wall, that stone wall, and I think all of us are feeling up against a lot of things we can't change, but to see some different ways through, and Krista's saying this is exactly what I needed this mm -hmm. morning. It's been grounding and helping provide a focus. Mm -hmm. Yes, because we need those reminders. We need those few words to come back to, and I love how you actually gave us three words. I'm going to sit with those for a while. Tomorrow. Yeah. Relationship, Relationship release, routine, and release. Routine. Yeah. Yeah. Some normalcy, right, in the midst of, of anything but. Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. I'm, I'm, we do have a few minutes. If there yeah, are questions, question feel free to type in. I could see Sarah's, uh, Sarah's um, um, wheels turning with the spelling, spelling idea. I could just see her. <laughs> I'd love to see you do that with your girls. It's so fun. It really is. But you have to frame it. If they're used to it being a certain way, you have to frame it. Um, you have to frame it because um, as this is just, it's part of it is to make mistakes. That's the whole point. The whole point of it is to get it wrong. It's in getting it wrong that we get it right eventually. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. And Foggle. I... <laughs> Foggle, absolutely. <laughs> Liz, we'll be posting um, some slide uh, handouts on campus for campus members to download after the fact. So yeah. keep tuned in the webinar center for that. We're kind of yes, hard. Sandra, it is a kind of a discipline, putting things in order. I loved that that reflection you had, Tamara, about the puzzle. There are certain mm -hmm. kind of cathartic activities right now, and, yeah. and something like putting pieces together, something structured and organized that we can actually... <laughs> Yeah, yes. there is a solution. I know it's funny. I'm doing one on spring right now, and there's a lot of white space. But even the white space, it's like even if there's a little bit of green, I can match this green. I can figure out where it goes. It's uh, it it's I have got a whole new determination in me. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Ah, uh, Miriam, that's a good point that she makes there. She says inviting making mistakes seems to be especially challenging with highly sensitive children. Sure is. It sure is. In fact, I, for one of my um, uh, highly sensitive child, uh, and actually it was for my nephew who was uh, homeschooling with us for a while, is I gave him um, a big eraser that says for big, for, for big mistakes. And it was just that idea. I, there's an, a beautiful book for this, um, Miriam. I don't know if you've heard it. I, if anybody that's been in any of my courses knows I read it all the time. In fact, I was very tempted to read it today, but I didn't. Um, and that is the book Ish, which is all about lifting the bar on getting it right and just just about being. And the whole thing is he draws these pictures and he doesn't know if they're right, but they're ish. You know, the vase doesn't know if it's actually a vase, but it's vase ish. And that permission somehow to be able to let down the word, you know, the spelling words, they're right ish, you know. Um, it's lifting the bar on the outcome to create some space and some room. Because for a child that's so sensitive to being wrong or to getting it wrong like I was, you got you to gotta sneak it in somehow. You got to just turn it on its head. Um, and it becomes part of the game. 
how wrong can we make this look? <laughs> yeah. Yes, as this is love Selena's accomplish. <laughs> We've had lots of plays yes, on this. Find the ish and accomplish. Yes, yeah. I love that. Yeah. In fact, I think I will be on my website. Um, I haven't really used my website yet, but I'm looking at sort of developing that now and trying to put some resources. And I'm thinking about reading some stories and having those on there. So stay tuned. If you uh, get some updates, I'll I'll try to uh, post some of those me reading those stories. Oh, Sarah, I like what Sarah writes here. I practice giving myself grace for making mistakes out loud in front of the kids. Yeah. It's good for them and it's good for me too as someone always trying to go into the perfectionistic mode. Yeah. Ah, yes. Beautiful, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. See. And, and Robin well. says to follow on Miriam's thoughts, even if they struggle to be okay with mistakes, we need to invite, 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 and make fun if our own, if yes. we can. That's where that silliness can come yes. in. In Not fact, to take ourselves too seriously. It is, and that's what I I've, I find. I do this when I'm when I'm teaching, and I teach university classes now, and um, I'm constantly doing this with my students. Is I just I just make space for my own, and and allow some space for 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 some of the silliness. I bring all my colored markers. Markers and I and I said, well, this is just how I am. I don't, you know, I don't, this is just, I, I can't write too clearly on the board, but that's just who I am. You know, I do other things much better. <laughs> and, um, you know, to be able to tease and be okay with that in yourself and not feel like you have to be perfect models that for your children or your students, right? It models it. It's in modeling it. That normalizes it. That's what what Sarah and Robin and and Miriam are talking about. It 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 allows it's, it makes them go, oh, oh, okay. Well, if that if that's true for them, this could be true for me. Not that they consciously think that necessarily. Yeah. Um. Yes, yes, Darla. I too am very much looking forward to the reclaiming our yeah. students book. Comes out April fourteenth. Um, it feels funny. We're not doing a big launch order right it on Amazon, but you can <laughs> order it. Yeah, you can still order it. We won't do a big launch until the summer, but because um, it's uh, but it's the the tagline is called um, why are why are why children are more anxious, aggressive, and shut down than ever, and what we can do about it. So it's just it's about relationship. It's about it's about play, about about finding those outlets um, for release, and uh, in the in the classroom and beyond. So have some notes for people who are doing this through homeschooling or who, you know, so it's particularly that part would be particularly apt right now. But, and those activities are wonderful that Hannah's put together. Um, there's not a Newfield Elementary School, Krista, per se. There's a lot of people who've been influenced by the work and who take those practices. Um, uh, you know, we have a, we have quite a few principals in different areas who have really intentionally implemented David McFall about in in the Ottawa area and um, um, uh, I can you know think of maybe many many others who will you'll you'll see elements um, where they recognize the importance of that connection and build some of these things into the practice but there's not a um, yeah we don't have one right now yes. A specific Newfeld school as of yeah. yet, but yes, yeah, some who have uh, been influenced by, and then Dr. Newfeld's done a lot of professional development at um, for school boards across mm -hmm. the country, particularly yeah. in the Lower Mainland. Yeah. I'm going to read in Robbins here. She says, they learn everything from what you actually do. I never taught my daughter to read. I just read to her. Shazam, she was the, the first to read in grade one. They really do learn without putting an outcome on it. And this is so true. I, it, it's so true, Robin. I am... Um, I, I always kind of shake my head. It's like, wow, it's it, it really, it really is amazing. Nature is amazing. Um, as humans, um, the design is amazing. Um, it's there. It's there. And uh, we think we have to have the special trick to make it unfold, but no, we just have to provide the right conditions. And and uh, presto, magic. Yeah. Yes, and yes, Darla, you did catch that. There is um, a handbook of activities that supports the book that they've put together yeah. that I've got a bit of a sneak peek of, and I'm very excited about that. Some sort of more of some ideas like what Tamara shared with us today, some things for us to sink yeah. our teeth into. 
And I just want to say too, this it again, the, the activities are, are separated out by ages, but these things, uh, what I was talking about, they're not age specific. We can read together with our children, we can play games, we can put their ideas at the forefront at any age. They may have better tools for being able to do this. You know, my daughter, her PowerPoint now is going to look different at 18 than it did at, at, at 7. Um, but, you know, so the tools may be different, but, but these things, this, there's not an age limit on any of these things. Yeah. Yes, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's an important reminder as well. I look, looks like we were, uh, we were, we we're at our time. Oh, it's so wonderful uh, to well, be here thank with you, you all, to know you were here. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Tamara, so much uh, inspiration, something to hold on to for us and ground us, some things to keep in mind as we walk this maze. We really does feel like we're walking a maze right yeah. now. I'm really, yes, and as Robin says, hoping parents can let themselves off the hook in terms of being the teacher right now. Yeah, yes, I echo that. Well said, Robin. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, and I wish you all the best, whatever your corner of the world is and whatever your situation is, I'm wishing you relationship, routine, and release now more than ever. And my heart goes out to all of you. Yeah. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you all for able to be here live and those watching the recording.